Hey folks, it's Tommy Frugal Prepper. While I've got everything out of my laptop bag, <laughs> I'll be organizing stuff. I thought I would just go through this and show you uh, kind of the hardware that I have for currently programming and, and diagnosing uh, with factory scan tools, um, J boxes. Um, so, you know, you can get a good bi-directional scan tool and some of those can do some minor reprogramming, uh, you know, reprogramming the configuration of modules, programming keys, uh, you know, stuff like that. But like GM, when you replace a module, you have to reflash it with new software. For that, you're gonna need a J-Box. Um, some of those factories, some of those scan tools come with J-Boxes and support for doing that. Um, I don't have the boxes or anything like that. Autel makes a J box now, um, <clears throat> but those J boxes are all really expensive. So I have some cheap Chinese clone ones that I use, um, and it can be a bit of a challenge to get them working sometimes. So we'll start here with the laptop, and this is a Lenovo Yoga. Uh, i7 16 gig terabyte hard drive it has a terabyte uh, micro SD and a little tiny USB reader down here. Um, this does flip over and go into a tablet mode. Um, let me put in my password here. Um, but basically, you know, I just have all these different virtual machines. So basically, what you run into is Ford is going to expect you to have a laptop that's dedicated to programming Fords, and GM's going to expect you to have that. And they have conflicting requirements. Some of them require 32 bits, some of them require 64 bits, some Windows 10, some Windows 7. There's even some out there that require Windows XP still. Um, and so Ford's going to just expect you to have your own laptop for a program in Ford's because they expect you to work at a Ford dealership, right? And you just program Ford's all day long. But when you work on a lot of different makes and models, what you do is you build these virtual machines. And so um, uh, you can kind of see me build one of these on my last video. I'll put a link to it down below. Um, but then you can have a separate configuration just as it's needed for each thing that you want to program. So I've got like my Mazda IDS, uh, my uh, Windows 7 GDS2 with the V6 Nano, uh, my Windows 7 Ford IDS, and my Windows 7 Chrysler. Um, and then on the actual laptop itself, I run the TechLine Connect, which gives me access to my, uh, my uh, SPS programming. And then I also run my tech to win on the laptop itself. Um, but uh, yeah, I've got my Mitchell on demand and all data, all that stuff set up on here too. And that all runs off of this uh, flash drive here, or off of this SD card. Um, but it's a pretty nice, decent laptop. Um, I'm really happy I have it. So a couple of things, you know, you may or may not need this extra storage. I think it's a good idea. You know, it's a hundred and. 30 bucks for that card, that little SD card. Um, uh, you probably don't need one that's that big. Uh, you can probably get by with a 256 or a 512. Uh, but it's nice to have that extra storage. Um, and then the other thing that I got for this recently is this has a USB-C charger. In fact, this is the, uh, the, the micro SD card reader is the only regular USB port. And then on this side, it has the USB-C for charging and a USB-C for plugging stuff in, and that's it. Um, you can get adapters. In fact, I, I have an adapter here somewhere. Um, I think on my iPhone, right? And so, well, here, here's one. You can get this adapter that adapts it to a regular USB. And that's good, but you really don't want all that hanging out when you're working on cars. Uh, because you'll have a tendency to bump things and break them off working on a car. You'll have it propped up on top of the motor or something working on it and it'll slide off. And then you break your USB port and you gotta worry about how you're gonna get that fixed. Because um, they don't come with a lot of extra USB ports these days either. Uh, but this is my magnetic charger. So that just it just 
has a piece that goes in there and then it, it holds on with the magnet and then if I bump it or something it just comes right off which is really nice um, and so what I've done is I've gone out and bought an actual USB-C cables for all my different ends so this is a USB-C to a mini uh, USB not a micro a mini which is what my uh, Y-Tech Micropod for Mopar takes. Um, this one is a micro, which is what my VCI or VCX Nano takes. <laughs> and I'd rather have this cable on here. It's a little more flexible, right? If I bump it into something, than having it hanging out off of a big adapter that's not flexible at all. Um, this is a USB 3.0. It's got the extra spot on there for the 3.0 part and it goes to the USB-C. And this is a regular USB one. So this is USB type B. This is for the Ford IDS and the GM uh, MDI. It's, not the, the, it's called a VCM or something on Ford, but it's Ford IDS. <laughs> so many acronyms to learn with this too um, but then I don't I don't charge my iPhone off of this often so I do have one of these little adapters on my iPhone charging cable this is my magnetic charging cable for my iPhone um, I have a similar little thing plugged into my iPhone to charge it and then I also keep one of these adapters that will adapt from USB to C just in case I need to plug something else in over here and it's USB-C, like say I need to use the CD-ROM while I got something else plugged in over here, I could do that. Or if I need to plug one of these things into a regular computer without USB-C, I've got that. Keep a couple flash drives, <laughs> flash drives just to save stuff on. These two are actually blank. This one's got some scratch data on it. And um, somewhere I got another one. Yeah, this is a backup of my my uh, VCX Nano software. Um, this is a endoscope, so it's for looking down the cylinder heads on motors to see if valves are stuck or bent. It's got the little mirror set up and everything on it here. Uh, I got this off of Amazon a long time ago. It works well. Works good enough to see what you need to see. You know, this is the CD for it. Keep a lot of screen cleaning wipes. Uh, because you have to clean your screen all the time when you're using a touch screen. <laughs> um, I also have this um, USB hub adapter. This has an HDMI port in case I need to hook up an external monitor or hook it up to a television or something. It has three USB 3.0s. has this one USB-C, but on this one, the transfer speeds are really low. I think this is actually connected via USB 2.0 and these are USB 3.0 and it has two card readers in it and it has a network jack on the end of it too. So I have that. Um, and somewhere, I think it's still in the bag, I have a network cable that I keep with me in case I need to plug into an ethernet. I don't normally use that for cars. Got my external CD-ROM drive just in case I need to get something off of a CD or DVD. But that's becoming less of an issue these days. Like most people don't use these anymore, right? And my charger, I went over that. But that's pretty much, you know, what you're looking at. You know, a twelve, thirteen hundred dollar computer, plus all the cables, accessories, and everything. You're, you're probably looking at two grand. You know, just just calculate that you're going to need two grand for the laptop, right? And uh, go big or go home as far as processing power RAM and storage. Better to have one big laptop than to try to carry around five different smaller ones all configured different and then you gotta make sure they're all charged when you need them and uh, it sucks when you get on site to program something and your laptop battery's dead because you left it on. Uh, so it, this is just nicer to have one laptop to worry about. Uh, so I'll kind of go through some of the uh, tools that I actually have that I hook into this. Um, I keep them all here in this Apache case. Um, 
washed the foam a long time ago, but I just stuffed them down in here. <laughs> um, this is my Pico scope, four channels. Really nice tool to have when you need it. This takes the USB 3.0 cable. Oh, there's my ethernet cable. <laughs> um, I've got some, the, the pro wires right here. I've got, uh, I've got a spark plug pickup, wire pickup here too. And I have some hand tech uh, low amp clamps that go on this, but they're not in here. Um, and then I've got my little thing of ends and stuff. My adapters, my attenuators and stuff are in there. This is a little backup power cable for my power inverter. Um, this is the Ford VCM2. Uh, it's a clone tool. Um, I just plug into the USB on it and, you know, right there, hook that up to the laptop and map that port to my virtual machine and then I can program. Um, the, when I program, when I'm loading the software on a module, I run this external power source um, to keep it basically make sure it has power. So this is a nine volt, center is positive, outside is negative, but it can run on five to 32 volts. Um, and so I keep this powered separately. The factory tools actually take batteries. This one does not. Um, and so I keep that powered with the external power supply. It's powered off the OBD2 port and I plug my laptop in and make sure it's charging. And I run a battery maintainer on the vehicle while I'm programming. So that makes sure all the voltages are going to stay good and strong because you don't want it to crash part way through programming a module and you end up breaking a module. Um, this is my OBD2 breakout box. It's got one loose terminal here. It's still connected, but it's loose. <laughs> I need to go through it, just put some hot glue on these and glue them all down really well. Um, but basically it's got a cable that you hook up on here and then you can pass through your OBD2 port to your scan tool or whatever. And you can go in here and hook on, look at the CAN buses and stuff like that, scope into it. Um, it's a handy little tool to have, it really is. Um, they make a nicer one of these. Um, like Ergo has one with all the flashy lights and stuff on it. I, I just got this cheap one, it does the job. Um, this is an extra USB cable. This is my VCX Nano. I'm still learning this tool. Right now I'm just running GDS on this guy. Um, and then I use my service programming and my tech to win off of my regular GM. Uh, but I believe you can buy extra licenses for this to program like Land Rovers and, and Bentleys and Jaguars and Hondas and Toyotas. Um, I'm looking into getting the Honda license. I emailed their support to ask him how that works. They, they haven't emailed me back just yet, but I'll let you know. This is just a USB or an OBD2 extension cable. It's great because you can plug it in here and then you can plug this into the car um, because sometimes those uh, OBD2 ports are in a place where you can't fit this. <laughs> so I have this extension cable and I bought this separate go with that. A um, couple of alligator clips um, and that's about it. I mean that's about what that's kind of my programming tools and really I don't even need the alligator clips in here those should be in my toolbox but I use them so often that I just keep a set and I usually keep a couple of the banana clip probes in there as well but they're not in here right now but I have extras in my toolbox. But that's, that's all my programming equipment. Um, that's my collection so far. It's, it's not the greatest collection, but it's my collection, right? <laughs> so, it's what I have. So, um, yes, I'd like to get a, a car deck or a three tech, um, you know, or even an Autel or a Bosch um, a J Box that can run with multiple softwares and stuff, but. I don't, I don't have a few thousand dollars to drop on that crap, so this is what I got right now. And uh, I'll look at expanding this as I need to, and as, as I use a tool so much that I break it, or 
I need to upgrade to a better one, it's good. I made my money back out of it. Now I'm ready to buy a real one, right? It's the way I look at it. It's the way I do tools in general. Buy the cheap one, use it till it breaks. If you use it till it breaks, it means you use it enough to afford a good one. If you use it once and you never use it again and it sits in your toolbox, you just saved all that money over buying a good one. That's the way I look at it. So. <laughs> uh, but, yep, that's what I got. I like this case really well, actually. Um, I don't think this side things are really necessary. I normally just clip them on the top and, and carry it. But this is the Apache something or another. The Apache 4800 from Harbor Freight. Works good. I think it's based off of like a Pelican case type of design. And it seems like it's as good as a Pelican case to me. But, but yep. So that's what I got. I'll talk to y'all later. Um, I can't really show you too much of the software because there could be some legal issues there for me. Um, and I don't want to get in legal trouble. So, uh, but yeah, um, you're gonna have some money wrapped up in this, and you're gonna have a lot of time wrapped up in getting these tools working and figuring them out. So be prepared for that. And. Even if you go with factory software, you're just going to have a lot of time, you know, a lot of time learning that uh, specific make and models programming technique, how they, with the acronyms they use, what websites you go to, how you buy the software, how you install it, how you download it, and, you know, they're all very different and it takes time. It just takes time to learn it all. And it's all different, so you have to learn it. There's no standards. They don't just have like an ethernet cable and you plug in there and load the files from Windows, right? It'd be nice if they did. It'd be nice if they were more standardized like PCs are. But they're not. Every manufacturer has their own way of uh, tackling that, that football runner, right? They, they got their own way. And uh, you just have to learn their way of doing it. Anyway, I'll talk to y'all later. Just time your frugal prepper. One other thing that you're going to need is an external drive. And um, for as much data as I have on these, each of those like uh, Windows images are like 30 or 40 gigs, right? So it's a lot of data to back up. Um, I use a program called Drive Snapshot. And it just basically takes an image of the whole computer, puts it on this drive. This is a USB 3.1 enclosure. can transfer data up to 10 gigabits a second. Um, in reality, this backs up 6 or 7 gigabytes a minute. Um, I have a Mushkin Reactor 500 gig solid state drive inside of here. Um, backing this up over my network, it takes 6 hours. Backing this up to here takes 20-25 minutes. Um, and then you can do differential backups every time you make little changes. But um, I have a video where I go through uh, doing a backup and restores on these, and I will link that video down below. But you're going to want a backup. And the nice thing about running everything in virtual machines is the virtual machines you can restore those and set them up on any other laptop. So if this laptop crashes and burns, I can restore all those virtual machines off of here, put them on a new laptop, and I'm good to go. You can get the extended warranty or the square warranty on the laptop, but they're not gonna cover your data and all your time you have in setting all this up. So this is a good investment. And you can get a standard you know, Western Digital Passport rotational drive. It's just gonna take longer to back it up, but you can let it sit overnight and back up. So that's what I have. Um, yeah, I have a, a server that I can keep my backups on as well. So I can plug this into my other workstation and just let that copy while I'm at work. And so I have a, I have a backup in two places on this drive and on my server. And, you know, just keep backups of your stuff. That's all I'm saying. All right, I'll talk to y'all later. It's Tom, the Frugal Prepper.